Good morning, everyone. Today's reading is from Acts chapter 27, verse, verses 13 through 26. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Run, running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. This is the word of the Lord. Take your Bible, if you will, and keep it open to Acts 27. If you've already turned there, if not, go ahead and make your way to Acts 27. And today we're going to cover quite a bit of ground. And uh, I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, before I get started in the message, though, I do want to say what a great week it's been, a Thanksgiving week. And while I might have been down with physical issue, uh, I'm just so thankful to be here today with you. And I'm glad that you're here. We do have others who are not with us today because of sickness. In fact, you saw Brenton leading this morning by himself along with just two other band members. Two of the band members are home. One is not feeling well. So uh, we continue to see that happen in life, and uh, yet God is glorified. Amen? Well, it's interesting. Last week, the, 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 the service that the Holy Spirit led the elders uh, with just what a profound uh, message came out of that whole day. When you think about the lives that were here that spoke, people who've gone through trial after trial and people who've come through all kinds of circumstances, yet they give glory to God on Thanksgiving. That says a lot, and I think that is the heart of a true Christian, that even in the difficult days, we keep our heads up. Whatsoever things are pure, honest, just, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, be any praise, Think on these things. Amen? Amen. Uh, set your mind to the things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. So while your body might be going through a turmoil, set your mind on Christ. Amen. All right. Hey, this morning, uh, oh, also, let me just mention, the Teen Challenge boys are with us. It's always good to have them. They're part of our church family. Boys, we love you. Amen. We love you. And this, this past... Thursday on Thanksgiving Day, I want to thank first the whole congregation who made food for the boys, who prepared food. I came early and there were men who were working, uh, uh, getting the turkey ready, 
And then they went on to their family activities. They didn't get to see the boys and get a chance to be part of the service. Well, there were a lot of people who were not present for the actual service, uh, the dinner, but they helped make it happen. So thank you, church. This is a wonderful blessing for us to minister to these boys and provide a home-cooked meal uh, in a setting that's as close to home as we can make for them where they are loved and appreciated. And I think they, I saw them piling the food on those plates and going back for seconds and some for thirds. And it just thrilled my heart to know that we could do that for them. So I, I wanted to pass that on to you, those of you who worked so hard to prepare the food. And the team that worked, amazing. Every year we have a great team, and I'm so thankful for that. As we approach chapter 27, I don't know if we can put on the screen, if you guys have it, Erica, but the map, uh, if we can go ahead and throw that up. Uh, this is a, just a, a, a little rendition. I don't have my pointing pen today, my laser pen, but if you go down to the bottom right corner, you see Jerusalem. We're starting out actually at Caesarea. That's where Paul was held for two years in prison. And then he is uh, by Roman cohort. He is being taken all the way up and coming across Asia Minor and then sailing down to Crete to get on the leeward side of the island the, the, this is the winter time, and so the wind's coming down from the north and trying to get away from the wind, and then they, somewhere out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea or at the, at the entry of the Adriatic Sea, they, they, they have a shipwreck. They, they literally lose control of the ship, and they land over in Malta, this little tiny island you can barely see. In fact, the name Malta is much bigger than the actual island on the, on the map. And then they make their way north, and they end up, obviously, up in Rome, where they were supposed to, to go for Paul to stand before Caesar and, and make his appeal to Caesar and really to share the gospel with Caesar. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. Paul's whole life, he said, I am a slave to Jesus Christ. Interestingly, that he would, con he would say of himself that he, he, he compared himself to a slave uh, of like a trireme ship a Roman ship, a battleship, where the front of that ship had a huge, uh, it was bunkered, it was really reinforced with wood and whatever else they used. And they had three tiers of little holes in the side of the ship on both sides, and an oar would fit out, and they would r get as much speed as they could to ram other ships. That's what the purpose of that ship was. Paul said, I am a I am a slave to Christ. I am a bottom-tier rower for Christ. He didn't see himself as the captain of the ship. He didn't see himself up on the deck. He didn't see himself on the first tier, the second tier. He said, I'm on the bottom tier. I don't consider my life anything. All he wanted to talk about was the surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ. He was a slave to Jesus not because he had to be. He chose it. He was a bond slave. That's what a bond slave is. Someone who the, the master says, I'm setting you free. You're free. You're no longer my slave. And they turn around and they say, no, I choose now. I choose to be your slave. And they would take an awl and they would put a, a, the ear down on a piece of wood and they would drive the awl through the wood and give them a ring or in the nose. They chose it. And that's what Paul did. So Paul didn't see himself as great. And this whole trip is, in, I want to leave that map up for the whole service if it's okay. Uh, that whole trip, he is on his way to share Christ. Everywhere he stopped, he shared Christ with people. Now, because I was out last week, uh, we're finishing up Acts. This is chapter 27 and today chapter 28. Obviously... We always go verse by verse, and sometimes we never even make it through three, five, ten verses, much less a chapter. Now we're covering two chapters in one day. If you look at from, from Caesarea all the way over to Rome, uh, that's a, the only way to get there quick is by jet. Okay? So we're doing a jet tour this morning. We're going to move quick. You say, why are you rushing it? We, we've not rushed the whole series. Why all of a sudden are we rushing the end? Because next Sunday we start a Christmas series, the first Sunday of, of December, and Brenton will be, Pastor Brenton will bring the first message, I'll bring the second message, he's going to bring the third week message, and then I'll, I'll uh, give a, short, uh, a shortened message on Christmas morning. 
And so we're excited about the series we're going to go into. And so we don't want to wait until January to come out, come back and do one chapter. So we're going to finish it all today. So if you're a stenographer, you're going to really be able to keep up and you're going to enjoy yourself today. The rest of us are going to suffer, okay? But we're going to cover. And so take your Bible, chapter 27, verse 1. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some of the prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. By the way, there were many cohorts or many uh, of these centurions that the Bible speaks of in the New Testament, in the, in the Gospels as well as in the Epistles. And it's interesting. Uh, the Bible generally speaks of a, of a centurion in a favorable way. If you think about it, Jesus was approached by a centurion and he wanted Jesus to heal his servant. And Jesus said, well, that's fine, I'll come to your house. And he said, oh, no, no, don't, I'm not worthy of you to come to my house. And I'm a man in authority, and I'm under authority, and I, I know that if you speak the word, it'll be done. And Jesus' response to the man was, I haven't found this much faith in all of Israel. Here's a Roman centurion, a Gentile, who has greater faith than Israel. And then there's another time where the centurion at the cross, the death of our Savior, remember that? who said, truly, this was the Son of God. So the Bible throws these centurions, many of them, not all, but many, in a very positive light. Then there's also the Roman centurion Cornelius, who became the first Gentile converted in the church. And not only Cornelius, but his entire house was converted. So this is an Augustan cohort. His name is Julius. And he's a very commendable man. He takes an interest and a liking to the Apostle Paul, and he actually spares Paul's life on this journey. Verse 2. We won't take that much time with every verse, I can promise. And embarking in a ship of Adramatum, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. And the next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. So here the centurion is giving Paul some freedom that other prisoners might not get so that he can actually see those who love him and know him along the way. So as I'm sharing these titles, you can see we're moving up the coast here in Sidon. Verse 4, And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus. So they go down, and they're going to come under Cyprus, which, uh, which is right there. And, uh, and they're going to sail under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. And we sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Sinaitis. And, uh, and, and, and as the wind did not allow us to go farther we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon. Coasting along, it was difficult, with difficulty. We came to a place called Fair Havens, okay, on the leeward side of, of uh, Crete, near, near which was the city of Lacia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because men, because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them. Let's, let's just stop for a second. Let me make a quick comment about that. So the fast is over. That, he's speaking of by, by early October, the fast had ended in Jerusalem. So now we're into probably November. And from November all the way to the spring, you don't sail in the Mediterranean Sea. The waters are too rough, and the storms can blow up quickly, and ships will be lost. And so that's the period of time. So he's probably in November as they are coming towards Crete here. And uh, uh, by the way, Adramidium was a city in the northwest coast of Asia Minor. That's modern Turkey. So they're make, making their way south down to Crete, and they get there. Verse 9, since much time had passed... And the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over. Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only on the car of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. So as they were harbored, you know, in Fairhaven, Paul's like, hey, fellas, uh, we don't want to go forward now. We're, 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 look, it's way too late in the season. 
winter's upon us and the seas are going to be too rough. Let's not do that. But the centurion, he went with the guy who owns the ship who sails all the time. And the guy owning the ship said, hey, look, I've got a great ship. I'm not worried about that. We're going to be fine. So they're going against what Paul said to them. Verse 12, and because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they, they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete. So now they're going to be on the western side of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. They are going to stop and spend winter. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. Okay, so get the picture. So Fair Haven's right there in the middle on the bottom of, 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 of uh, Crete, and they're going to go to the, to the west side of the island, and they're going to put down their anchors and stay there through the winter. So they're not going very far, just along the bottom of Crete there, traveling left. And, and so look what happens, verse 14, but as soon as a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster. How many? The, this message ought to really thrill the hearts of fishermen because you're, rec you're recognizing words and you're understanding things, leeward side of the island and all that kind of stuff. You're, you're probably just enjoying this. You're not enjoying the tempest part, okay, because you would never want to go out in that, right? Uh, so here they are, a Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave, them, we gave way to it. And we're driven along. So while they're under Crete, moving along, trying to get to the other side of the island, even in that little distance, all of a sudden the northeaster blows up and they are in trouble. Verse 16, running under the lee of a small island called uh, Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear and thus they were driven along. So they pulled in the sail, and they just let the storm drive the ship, okay? They, they were doing everything they could physically to survive this furious storm. Verse 18, since we were violently tossed, uh, storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo, okay? Now the waves are coming over the side of the boat to, a, to the extent we're going to sink, we got to get rid of some cargo, lighten the ship so it'll raise up in the water. And so... And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. So the pulleys and all the heavy equipment they threw overboard that they didn't need. And when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. This is like, we're going to die out here. This is it. They've come to the end. So they are adrift, they've lost their bearings, they, they, without the sun and stars, they don't know where they are, they have no clue. Verse 21, since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Now, that is a parent's message to a child, is it not? Okay, that's what happens. The parent says, don't do it. I wouldn't do that. That's, that's, that's not the best way to go. And we go and do it anyway. We're young, we're impetuous, and we, we're going to do it our way. And we do it, and we make a mess, and now we need dad or mom or both to bail us out. And the first words from dad, I told you. You should never have done that. It's like you got to hear it again. And uh, here's Paul, you know, laying it on, you know. I'm sure they weren't appreciating his words at that moment. But they were going to appreciate his words greatly here in just a second. Yet now, look at verse 22. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Huh. Let that sink in. You're on the boat. You've lost all sense of bearing. You brought the sails in. The wind's just taking you wherever it wants to go. You don't know where you're going. You've had to get rid of all your cargo. You haven't eaten for days. Now this man's telling you to take a little bit of food. The ration was so small, it would have been a handful of food for the whole day. And, and, and then he says, but here's the good news. You're not going to die. But the ship is going to wreck. We're going to lose the ship. So now in your mind, what are you thinking? I'm about to get wet. And I don't see any land in sight. This is not good. 
So even the good news was a lot of bad news, right? For 14 days, they haven't seen the sun or the stars. Verse 22, yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you. Verse 23, for this very night there stood before me an angel of, the, of God. This is Paul now talking. There's, there stood before me an angel of, of, of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. Now that's very good. I love that. Not only is it the God who Paul worships, he says, I am his. A lot of Christians like to worship God. They, 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 they try hard to be faithful worshipers of God, but they've never understood their identity in Christ. They don't know that they are his. Paul knew he's the God I worship and I belong to him. My God knows me. My God will not abandon me. This is really good. And he said, do not be afraid. This is what God told Paul. He said, do not be afraid, Paul. Called him by name. You must stand before Caesar. In other words, this storm is not going to in any way, shape, or form uh, change the direction of my plans for you. See, our God is a sovereign God. That means he knows everything and he orchestrates everything. It is the providence of God for Paul to stand before Caesar. And no northeaster is going to stop that. And no shipwreck will stop it. This enabled Paul to have incredible peace and calm even in the midst of a horrendous situation. Think about that. Consider that in your own life when you come into a, a, a great trial. Do you still have peace? If you say, well, I'm a God worshiper, great. But let's say you're so sick you can't even worship. How are you going to get peace if, if your peace comes from your worship of God? I'll tell you how. By remembering who you are in Him. Even when I can't, I still belong God doesn't kick me out of the family because I can't worship him the way I would like to worship him. You understand what I'm saying? Very important that we remember that. So take heart. I love this. Oh, even the, before, he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Oh, my goodness. Not only, Paul, am I going to make sure that my plan works out, but I'm going to go ahead and save everybody that's with you. So take heart, men, Paul said, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. You say, okay, is he just speaking to a handful of crew? No. Listen, on that ship was 200, I was at 267 or 276 people on that ship. It's a cargo ship, but 200, over 200 people are on the ship. And he's saying, none of you are going to die. Take heart, God is with us. He'll, God, listen to what he said. For I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. It will be exactly as God has told me. My God does not lie. My God does not change. He's immutable. And it will be exactly as God told me. And in this situation, it's God's plan to get Paul to Rome without death. That's the plan. Later in Paul's life, it was God's plan that he be a martyr. We only know that from Eusebius and some other of the great histori historians of the day. The Bible doesn't tell us how Paul dies. But uh, they said that he was actually had his head cut off. And uh, we have to assume it was, it was martyrdom. It was because he would not shut his mouth about God and about Jesus being Messiah. So, very important here that we get this. Jesus stood by Paul during the night when they had given up hope of ever making it to Rome. And the Lord come now comes to Paul and assures him, I told you, you're going to get to Rome, Paul. You'll make it to Rome. So Paul urges the crew and the ship. Uh, by the way, there's nothing like traveling with a godly person. 
If you board a plane and you're heading to Tegucigalpa in Honduras, I'm going to tell you right now, you want to either be a godly person or you want to be next to a godly person. You want to know there's a godly person on that plane because it's one of the most treacherous runways to approach in the world because as you come in, the plane tilts, you see Tegucigalpa and you see this huge mountain right behind the airport, the strip that you're going to land on. And the, 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 the strip, the air, the air uh, strip, is facing downward. And you're coming up, and now you're heading straight to the mountain. I mean a mountain that's as high as the plane, because you're not that flying that high now. You're getting ready to land. And all of a sudden, it banks completely, and now you are literally along the face of the mountain, and then he banks again, and you're coming down the slope of the mountain on that airstrip. And then you hit ground and you're moving, you're like this, sitting in your, it's not this, it's not this, you're leaning forward because you're going down the airstrip to come to a stop. And he's doing everything he can to stop that plane before it runs off the runway. You, you better know a man of God on that plane, that there's one there. You, you want to sit next to him if you can. And literally, this is funny, one time flying into Tegucigalpa, I'll never forget, I was asking somebody, I always like to share Christ, talk to people, and the guy next to me was a businessman coming into Tegucigalpa. And uh, he says, so what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. He goes, oh, a man of God. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I love the Lord. He goes, oh, I'm so thankful you're here with us today. Because <laughs> he flied that route a lot, you know. He goes, it's an added blessing to know that a man of God is on the plane with us. Well, I don't think it's, that doesn't always translate, you know. God will take out a man of God too if, he's, if it's his time's up, you know. But, but, the, but that's what Paul's saying here. God told Paul, they're not going to die because they're with you. They're with you. And he said, verse 24, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God had grant, has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have told, as I have been told. Now remember the context. He's on a ship being driven by the wind and it's in a bad situation all hope has been lost and paul's talking this way okay that's a christian coming into the room right there that's how we should respond to people in this world not for show but when we come into the room all of a sudden forget about the thermometer that's reading the temperature of the room we come in as a thermostat we come in and we set the temperature not because something we do or by action. It's that we come with joy in our heart that we know who we belong to and we know that God is at work and we come no matter what the situation, whatever the circumstance, we bring a higher level of peace into that situation. Amen? That's the way it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be. But we must run aground. <laughs> I love that. So take heart, man. We're have faith in God that it will be exactly as I've told you. But, but, it's a big but, we must run aground on some island. <laughs> okay? When the 14th night had come, as soon as, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were not, that they were nearing land. They probably heard the waves crashing against the shore or something. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms, and a little far, farther on they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that, they, that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. Now, it keeps saying we, we, we. So who's writing all this? Luke. Luke is writing this. He's with Paul. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, see, that's, they, they were carrying prisoners, and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. And so, man, this is a very serious deal here. Paul has taken over here. Notice that. He's now giving the orders, and they're all listening. The captain's probably, you know, down in the hold somewhere in the ship, probably in chains at this point for his advice to sail. But Paul's taken over. He's giving the commands and the orders now. Verse 32, and then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat, and let it go. 
And as day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food. 14 days without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, a handful, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of you. Now, by the way, this ship was a cargo ship from Alexandria to Rome. Egypt is what fed Rome. And so their ships would go out, and they would travel together oftentimes, bringing grain to Rome. So it's highly likely that when this storm came up, maybe two or three ships, when it says they shored up the ship, they, 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 they supported it, strengthened it, it's, they tied off together. That's probably what happened. But now they've already jettisoned all the food. They've jettisoned anything that would keep them, or that would keep them afloat, keep them from being afloat. Uh, so take this food, it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. Now, Paul could have sat back and said, okay, God told me that nobody's going to die, therefore we don't have to do anything, just, just know that we're going to be fine. He didn't do that. Paul said, we're not going to die, God said we're, we're going to live. Now, let's do what we can to survive. You don't stop functioning as a person, you don't stop using your mind just because God's given you a confidence by a promise in his word. You still... For example, if you're sick, the first thing I do is pray. And I say, Lord, you know my life. You know everything in, in my life. And so I bring this to you, and I hand it over to you, this sickness. And then after I do that, then I, if I'm sick enough, I'll call the doctor. Okay? In other words, I'm going to do what I, my capacity of understanding allows me to do. But not because I have lack of faith. God will use doctors also to touch us and heal us. I mean, he's the one that gave a doctor the mind to know how to deal with the human body, right? So give God all the glory. I mean, if a doctor helps me with something, I'll say to the doctor, praise God. Man, he really showed you how to do that. That's awesome. Thank you. The doctor's like, what? what? I did that. No, you got a God complex. God did that. God did that. Verse 32. So they cut the ropes of the ship. Now they've been sailing for 14 days. They've not eaten. Take some food. Verse 35, and when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all. He broke it and began to eat. Does that sound familiar to any of you? When Jesus fed the 5,000, when Jesus appeared to the two men walking, the two disciples walking towards Emmaus, that he would take the bread, he would give thanks for it, and then he would break it and distribute it. And here Paul is showing a beautiful custom of giving thanks to God for his food. Oh, what a wonderful thing when God's people, you and I, in a restaurant, stop to give thanks to God for our food in the restaurant. Don't do it in a showy way. You're not doing it to be seen. You're doing it because you honor God even with the food that you eat. What a wonderful lesson to teach your kids. Yesterday, we were coming back from the Melbourne Zoo with our daughter Lauren and her husband Graham are here with their five kids. You guys stand, I know Graham, you hate this. Stand up real quick. And kids, uh, the only one in is our oldest granddaughter. This is Reese, Therese, and we're glad to have them. Thank you, thank you guys. Uh, yesterday, Rini and I took, took three of the five to the Melbourne Zoo. And coming home, we stopped to get a bite to eat. And I looked over at the table next to us, and they were praying. And I thought, wow, that's beautiful. And of course, we did the same. We always pray before we eat. So right there, there's a connection with other people that we don't know. And that's a beautiful thing for Christians, that we, that we, we carry forward these important things that we do. One is giving thanks to God, even for food. Don't stop doing it. Now, don't do it for show. I remember when I was a young pastor, and I went to a conference, a convention, 20,000 Christians gathering in this little town, and it was time to go eat, and so I found a little restaurant somewhere to eat with my friend. And, uh, and, and this big group, about 25 people came in, and they too were from the conference. And they came in, and then the big honcho, the big guy, you know, the, 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 the big hog came in, you know, of that group. <laughs> and he looks at them all sitting there, you know, and this, this is a public restaurant. He, had, he goes, and they all stand, and they sing out loud in the restaurant the doxology. But they did it in such a way as to bring attention to themselves. It made me want to puke. 
It had nothing to do. That's pharisaical. So I'm not talking about going into a restaurant and making a scene. I'm talking about being faithful to God even in a restaurant to give thanks. And you never know. It'll stir conversation. You see somebody else praying, hey, are you believers? Yeah. Now you've got conversation. You're making friends. It's wonderful. So they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Uh, There it is. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. Verse 36. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders, and then hoisting the uh, the foresail to the wind they made uh, for the beach. And striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern the bow, not the bow, the bow stuck, and the stern was being uh, broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners. Why? Because as a Roman soldier, you never wanted to lose a prisoner. If they escaped, then you would be put to death. So they were going to kill them, lest anyone should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered that those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. So 276 people brought safely, as God had told Paul by the angel. Okay, So the people on the ship survived the shipwreck by the will of God. I love that. God's will will always... Listen, many are the plans of a man's heart, Proverbs says, but the plans of the Lord will prevail. That's why as a church we've, we've, we've built this whole thing on this presupposition. We're not out to try to create something. We're not out to try and have this vision of what we want our church to be. We, we only want to join God in what His plan is and what He is doing. I, I'd rather pray and say, Lord, uh, this is what we sense you're wanting us to do. So Lord, go with us. Give us insight. Give us direction. Give us discernment as we try to follow your leadership. Then to pray, Lord, we've got this great vision. This is what we're going to do, and now we just need you to bless it. We don't need God to bless our plans. Your plans are not God's plans. They're not as good. And I've done that before as a pastor, and it doesn't work. It might work for a season, but it doesn't last. We want to follow God. Amen? And that's what Paul did here, and they made it. Okay? Now, where are we at in time? Okay, let me just fly through chapter 28. It's a short chapter. So after we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. Interesting, last week we had uh, Marshall Pennell, one of our elders, who gave a video from Malta. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, That's God's sovereign hand. One of our own elders was in Malta last week and gave a wonderful testimony uh, from Malta. And, and the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. There was still this storm raging, folks, even while they're on land. They haven't eaten much. They don't have, they're, not, they're not properly uh, dressed. It's winter. It's cold. And so the people of that island and their kindness made a huge bonfire, Okay. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, interesting, stop right there for a second. So here's Paul. He didn't have food for 14 days either. He, his clothes are tattered. He's, he's tired. He's weary. He had to swim to shore. He, he, he's just like the 275 other people. And yet Paul doesn't go over and sit down and just let the people of Malta do all the work. Paul says, I, I want to contribute So he goes over and he starts to gather sticks for the fire. I'm not sure all 276 did that. Maybe he's the only one that did it. Maybe he and the crew did it. I don't know. But Paul is laying an example here. I I just think that's really important. He's not the kind of person to just sit back and let others do the work. He wanted to get involved and contribute. Oh, in the life of the church, this is a major problem in North America in the church is we have people who come with a consumer mentality to church. I'm here to consume. I'm not here to serve. 
I just want to consume. I sure hope he preaches a good sermon. I really need good worship today. I, I, I hope it's me. And when you're saying those kinds of things, if that's your heart, is not to serve, not to, not to somehow um, um, engage. Now, when you're new, you, we don't expect you to do that. We would never. But as you get into the life of the church, we want you to finally participate with us. We're in this together. But if somebody just has this mentality, I'm just here to get, man. I mean, I want good worship. I want good preaching. And boy, he was off today. I hope he's better next week. If he's not, I'm going to go down the street. That's a consumer mentality. And so here, here's what it looks like, okay? This is what it looks like when a person has a consumer mentality going to a church. They come in and they want to suck the life from the church. They don't want to pour anything into the church. So here you are. You sit in your pew chair. You hook up. <laughs> Just let me suck. Let me get whatever I can. And then let me leave. You go home fat and happy. Man, that was a good sermon today. I need a wheelbarrow to get out of here today. <laughs> That's not the way that the church functions. Look at Paul. Paul is serving. Paul, Paul is, even though he's wore out tired, he still has joy. And he still wants to tell others about Jesus. He does his part. I love that. I just love that. And by the way, that's, that's our church. I, I, can, I can happily say that as one of the shepherds of the flock. We, that's what you guys do. We have a great church. People get involved. I love that. Last week you preached a sermon. Praise God. Amen. That's, that'd be kind of cool. You go to somebody, they say, hey, what did you guys do on Thanksgiving? You know, what kind of a service? Oh, the whole church preached. It was wonderful. You did by your testimonies. Okay, so when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper, a poisonous snake, came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. That's an interesting insight there. Okay, when the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He's not going to escape the fact that he's a bad man. God's going to get, the gods are going to get him. That's why, they, that's why this snake attached to him. And, and isn't that the way the world thinks? Isn't that the way some Christians think? Something befalls you, and immediately, man, if I hadn't sinned when I was younger, this would never have happened. As if God's measuring your past sins for your future blessing. And because you don't have, you have a bad past, there's going to be curses that God's going to put on you. That is not Scripture. That's not in the New Testament at all. Stop thinking that way. And here they are thinking that. Well, then all of a sudden, they, they're watching. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. So he didn't start screaming and yelling for help. Paul's just like, ah, no big deal. Verse 6, they were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. That's interesting. One minute they're saying you're a murderer, and now you're a god. I mean, you're just all over the map with people in the world. That's our world today, is it not? You can fall from grace quick in this world. One bad situation, one bad word coming from your mouth, one scenario, and no matter how much good you've done, they will trash you, throw you on the scrap heap. That's the world today. It was the world back then. And, but Paul is faithful, and he's not living by what people think about him. When they said he's a murderer, he's like, ah, no big deal. I know I went through a difficult time and, and uh, was, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a forced termination uh, as a pastor. And that leadership team said he didn't commit any illegal acts. He didn't, there was nothing, uh, you know, um, there was nothing illegal, nothing unethical that he did. Um, but that didn't stop people in the community from wondering. And we, we, Rene and I heard, oh, well, here's what happened. Pastor Greg got caught looking at pornography on a laptop. <laughs> Somebody else, Pastor Greg had a nervous breakdown. You'd be surprised at all the things. None of it had an ounce of factual evidence to it because it wasn't true. That's people. Don't, don't let that knock you off course. You go with God. You know what God thinks about you. You know who you are in Christ. You know who you are. So let God lead you through those times, okay? 
no matter what man says to you. And man will say all kinds of crazy things. And then turn around, you know, here's, here's what I've learned in life. You'll never be as good as people say you are. Ever. Secondly, you'll never be as bad as people will say you are. <laughs> okay, so why live by what people say? Don't do it. So verse 8, it happened that the father of Publius uh, lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. I love that. Okay? Uh, he was like the chief man of the island, and Paul healed him. Verse 9, and when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. So the treatment that they received on the island of Malta was very good. And God worked among the Maltese people, healing them, and also many were saved. So there's a reason for the shipwreck. The people of Malta needed to be saved. Verse 11, and after three months we set sail on a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria. Again, Egypt was the feeder system for Rome. And with twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, at south, at, at one day a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to Puteoli. So they spent the rest of the winter months on the island of Malta, but then set sail and, uh, on another cargo ship. Verse 14, then we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the forum of Apius. That would be the Apian way, or the Apian way. And the three taverns to meet us. And on seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. I love that. Wherever you travel in the world, there are believers. And it's interesting, when you meet believers somewhere else, uh, on some other island or wherever you're traveling, when you meet them, there's an instant kinship. And you, they're, they're, they're your people. They're part of your family, the family of God. And immediately you feel like we're amongst friends. You just met them, but it's different. That's the beauty of, of the body of Christ. That's the beauty of being, belonging to God's family. And verse 16, And when we had come into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. And after three days, he I love that. So this centurion continually gives Paul freedom. He lets him go meet with his friends, but he's with him in chain. He's chained up, but he's still letting him go. He does all these things, puts him in a house, but doesn't keep him so bound up that he can't see his friends that come and visit. Paul could write letters. He could do all kinds of things because of the, the, the favor that he had with this, this centurion. So he was allowed to stay by himself with the, with the soldier who guarded him. So he had as much freedom as possible, even though he was still chained. Okay? Verse 17, after three days he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered he said to them, brothers, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my, my nation." So the reason he's saying this to these Jewish people in Rome is because he wants them to know, I'm not here, and I didn't do something to come against the traditions of, of Jerusalem or of, of, of Judaism. He, he wasn't trying, that was not his fight. He, he wasn't trying to go negative. He was staying on the fact that this Jesus is Messiah. And for this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. What is the hope of Israel? Messiah. It's because of Jesus that I'm wearing this chain. I wanted to meet with you here in Rome, you Jews that are here, and I wanted to tell you about Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so, verse 21, And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what, you, what, are, what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere else is spoken against. What sect? The followers of Jesus, the Jews who follow Jesus. What do you think about the sect? What do you think about this Jesus that you folks follow? So, verse 23, when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning, look at this, till evening, 
Paul expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So Paul takes the whole day and starts sharing with his fellow Jews who Jesus is and how he fits, how Messiah fits into the Old Testament that they knew through the law of Moses and also through the prophets. So a great number of Jews gather, they're listening, and he showed them so many things here. He pointed to the eternal one who would come and rule over the people of Israel. And he would be born in Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5 verse 2, he no doubt used that. But you, O Bethlehem, uh, who are too little to be among the clan of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. He's forever. He lives forever. He's speaking of Jesus there. He probably showed them that Jesus, the Messiah, would be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. But at his birth there will be great mourning by Rachel. Paul, I'm sure, covered Jeremiah 31, 15. Because Herod had all the children killed, there was weeping by Rachel. And then he probably went on, no doubt, and from the Old Testament scriptures showed that the child was born and was actually God. Incarnation. We're going to talk about that next month. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So Paul's walking through the pages of the Old Testament that they know so well, and he's showing them how those pages speak of Messiah to come, how God is raising up a kingdom, and Jesus is king. He calls, probably went into Daniel, Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's speaking of the triumphal entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem as he came into Passover week where he would die by the end of the week. And then he probably went to show them how Jesus would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah spoke of that. So he's he's giving them every opportunity to see Jesus in the scriptures that they know so well. And it says in verse 24, look, and some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. I want to close out our time with this, this thought. Some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. That is always the result of faithful preaching of the gospel. There will be those who believe and others who disbelieve. They they believe not. Those who believe receive Jesus as Messiah and they see him as the promised king of the Bible and they place their hope and trust in him because he is the one that saved them from the wrath of God and saved them from their sin. He's forgiven them by his perfect work of atonement on the cross john 1 9 through 13 there's other people they disbelieve that you say well i I haven't decided yet yeah you just did you decided not to believe that's the only other option you either believe or you don't there's no in between and and here today in this room i'm sure there are people who believe and others who believe not but here's the thing, here's the, what's said. John 1, 9, <clears throat> the Gospel of John, Jesus said the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world, I'm sorry, John, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The only way you can be born again is by God. 
You don't save yourself. You, you believe in God's salvation of you. John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. If you're in the camp of, of believing not, then I hate to say this, but the Bible says that right now the wrath of God is on you. This message that's out there today among Christian circles that somehow if you'll just, if you'll just accept Jesus in your heart, that's nowhere in the Bible. That's man. That's man's way of salvation. Man doesn't want to tell you that right now, if you have not believed in Jesus as the Son of God, that you are under the wrath of God. See, the greatest thing that Christ saved you from, if you're a believer, is not going to heaven. The greatest thing is that God's wrath has been lifted from you and placed on Jesus. He took your place. He took on the wrath of God for you. But if you believe not, the wrath is still on you. So what you and I believe is important. Our destiny hangs upon it. And according to the scriptures, some believe and some believe not. In fact, if you want to go by scripture, only a few believe. The mass will not believe. We're all, same, we're all exposed to the same truth, the same proofs. And some believe and some don't. Most people who believe not do so because they have preconceived prejudices. They've chosen to simply listen to the people who don't believe, who base it on all kinds of weird stuff, and they just accept that that's the truth. Uh, why should I believe? Nobody else believes. Again, Jesus said, wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many will find it. That's the group that you're putting yourself with. Only few will find it, will truly believe. People who don't believe, generally speaking, and not everybody, but generally speaking, they're unwilling to do an honest evaluation of who Jesus is. They've never done it. They've just taken what people have said. I just told you what some people said about me. But really, if you want to know who Greg really is, you would probably ask my wife or my kids. Nobody knows me better than they do. If you're going to know who Jesus is, don't listen to the people that are saying all kinds of crazy stuff who also have come to a presupposition of prejudice. They just chose not to, not to do the study. I'm not going to give Jesus an honest opportunity. I'm not going to look at that and believe. Don't let that be you. Listening to a person's enemy is not the way that you discover truth. The way you discover truth is you go to the person of truth. You go straight to the Bible. You go straight to the words of Jesus. Jesus himself said he was God. Jesus himself claimed to be the only way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to God, God the Father except through God the Son. I personally believe with all my heart that Jesus is in fact the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. He's the king that God promised would come and he will fulfill the prophecies of all the Old Testament. In Acts 4.11, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. The next verse. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So you can listen to people who have already pretty much closed off the notion of studying to find out the real Jesus. They only have chosen a Jesus that they've created in their mind, and they don't like him. And they don't understand. Many of them just don't. The light has not come on. God's not opened their eyes to see the gospel. Don't let that be you. If God is here today, which he is, and if he's turning the light on, follow him. Know who Jesus is. I've been telling you who he is. Believe, just believe. 
In 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God may com- be complete, equipped for every good work. So here Paul recognizes that the Holy Spirit is the author. He's the author. Why not go to the Holy Spirit? He's God. And let him tell you who Jesus is. Look at verse 25. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand and you will indeed see but never perceive for the people's heart has grown dull and with their ears they can barely hear and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Mm. So Paul's now quoting to those Jews from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah being one of their prophets verse 28, therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Paul is on a mission and he's not going to stop until God says his time time is up. He's going to share Christ with anybody and everybody that he can. I love that. What a great way to end the the gospel or end the book of Acts. And what's interesting too, you say, why didn't didn't Luke record all the way to Paul's death? Because he fulfilled everything Jesus said would be fulfilled in in Acts 1.8. The Spirit will come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world, Rome. Paul's done it. He's completed his task. And now, while he was in, what what happened while he was in prison in Rome? He writes the letters. He writes Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. He wrote those from prison. And and what's the letter of Philippians all about? Joy! He's in prison, bound by chain, writing a letter about joy to the people in Philippi, the believers. Oh, whatever you're lot in life follow God he puts you there believe me he puts you there for a reason let God's joy fill your heart always be a believer that's willing to share Christ with anybody and everybody amen amen Amen. Amen. we made it (laughs) we made it it's been a wonderful study in the book of Acts I don't even remember when we started had to be a year ago at least and uh, but God is faithful So let's go ahead now and let's just give contemplation. Let's just right now think about yourself. Do you believe? Or are you in the camp of those who believe not? I pray that if the Holy Spirit is turning the light on for you to see, that you will just receive what he's showing you. Father, we thank you that your love is not something that we generate our salvation is not something we generate. It's you coming to us. Unless, um, unless a man is drawn by the Holy Spirit, he cannot know God. And so we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you how you come to us to reveal to us who Jesus Christ really is as, as the Savior, the Messiah. Now we need to personalize it. We need to simply receive this calling, this election that God has given. And I pray that that's exactly what people are doing in this room right now. Thank you for your love and thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness, your patience with us. Some of us have waited years before we finally had the light turned on and believed. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We have elders. We have prayer partners who will come to the front if you need prayer for any matter in your life. Keep Deb Walker in prayer. She woke up today with some dizziness, experiencing some vertigo. That's why she and Scott are not here. And also, uh, I'm heading right to the hospital now, uh, but uh, let's keep uh, Michael Fitzgerald in prayer. He was taken to the hospital last night. I do think he's doing better, and they'll probably keep him for observation. Also, remember Jimmy Morrison. Jimmy uh, had a, a mild stroke yesterday morning, 
and he's been in the hospital. They've been observing him. He, his CAT scan results were good. They're waiting for an MRI result, and so they're watching him as well. But he has full faculty. He's able to speak, and so that's good. But let's just keep these folks in prayer, okay? God bless each of you. I pray that you have time to fellowship before you walk out, okay? God bless you.